Good morning, brothers and sisters and friends. Today is another exciting day for our new series of Facebook presentations. My name is Anthony Nacarado, and I'm proud and privileged to be the New York State President of the Sons and Daughters of Italy in America. We are a 115-year-old national organization that was founded in 1905 to promote our ancient culture and heritage. We became united in one organization of men and women of Italian ancestry in order to assist, assist each other to navigate the extreme challenges being faced by our ancestors who had the courage and the optimism to leave their home and come to an unknown land. They persevered against incredible odds, embracing America and assimilating into the American way of life. My friends, this is our second Facebook live show. Our first, All Things Columbus, received over 3,000 views thanks to the efforts of all involved, including our studio, New York Video in Belmore. Today, we have another fantastic show for you. It is one of the crown jewels of the sons and daughters of Italy in America, the Garibaldi Meucci Museum in Staten Island, New York. Since we have two terrific guests who are experts on the sacred museum to Italian Americans, now without delay, I would like to introduce them. Next to me on my left is Joe Shami, a past state and national diet president and current president of the National Foundation and the current CEO and president of the museum. Joe was involved in numerous other Italian American organizations, too numerous to name at this time. Suffice to say that he's devoted his life to the Italian American cause. To my right is Carl Chacho, an educator and chairperson of the museum. Carl has been working tirelessly since I appointed him last June and has overseen a tremendous amount of much needed improvements during this period that the museum was closed due to COVID. Good morning, gentlemen. Welcome, and let's learn something wonderful facts about a very historic and pleasant museum. Good, Good morning, day. Joe. Buongiorno, buongiorno. I'm delighted to be here to uh, share with our audience some very interesting information. Um, I brought with me a little prop. This is a prop of Giuseppe Garibaldi. Garibaldi uh, was a very, very famous general who uh, accomplished a, a tremendous amount of travels. He was known as the hero of two worlds. And we're very fortunate to say that in 1850, he arrived on Staten Island, uh, just a, a short number of what, 30 miles away from here in Belmore. Uh, Garibaldi in settling at the Garibaldi Michi Museum lived with Antonio Meucci that we're gonna hear about very shortly. And what occurred there was that basically uh, they lived in this house that was built in 1843 a home that uh, still stands till today, as you can see in the backdrop of this wonderful movie. So uh, the house uh, was not exactly on that spot right now. It uh, is at 420 Tompkins Avenue across the street from where it was. It was rolled there and put on a firm concrete uh, foundation. And actually years later, a cupola was built around it. Unfortunately, the cupola was made of wood, and as a result, because of termite infestation, it was taken out in the late 20s. But the story is that the two gentlemen lived at the house, and then after uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi passed away in 1882, uh, it was considered a memorial to him. His medals, his red shirt that we will see later on in the program was there, obviously, at the museum. What occurred is that the community of Staten Island had not cared for the museum very well. And as a result, the Order of Sons of Italy in America, founded in 1905, decided in 1919 to take over responsibility of the museum. And since that time, the Order of Sons of Italy has cared for the museum. Fortunately, because of the United States tax laws in 1959, the museum came under the umbrella of a 501c3 category which means that it has been fully tax exempt, both on federal government and state government uh, levels. Uh, not to mention the fact that we are a United States historic landmark, which makes it very, very credible and important. We're also registered by the New York State Board of Education, uh, by the Board of Regents, which means that we can provide all sorts of classes on the premises of the museum. Again, uh, the Sons of Italy Foundation uh, in Washington, D.C., owns the Garibaldi Mission Museum, but proudly enough, in 1976, it was uh, given by virtue of an agreement, a dollar a year to rent to the New York State Grand Lodge Foundation, of which you are the state president. 
And so as a result, for all these years since 1976, a board of commissioners, a board of directors was established. And therefore the board of directors is headed now by Carl Chacho, who will be speaking shortly. I, as president of the Sons of Italy Foundation, I have a national board of overseers that the national president, Nancy DeFiori Quinn, has appointed. Every two years, we have a new board of national directors. But the day-to-day -day operation is managed, overseen by the New York State Grand Lodge. Uh, being a historical monument has its pluses and minuses, does it not? Definitely. Uh, well, one of the things is that there's very little that we can change at the museum. Externally, there's nothing. In fact, most recently, we received a wonderful uh, grant and that grant covered a new security alarm system. It caused the uh, renewal of the doors that you see exhibited in the photo that have been restored to their original look. So we have to be very careful what we do. Um, as a result, we're listed um, on many publications and we receive grants. The grants from the city government and state government have helped us tremendously. So that's why it is a benefit to be a state and nationally recognized. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Carl, you, you run the everyday uh, uh, factors of the museum. Uh, it's a challenge for a 160, 170-year-old building. Uh, and I know you did a lot of work recently. Can you uh, give us a little background on what you've done in the last six months during this pandemic? Absolutely. First, I want to um, thank you for inviting me. I feel honored to be here. Uh, I am... Um, uh, very close to the museum um, logistically, so it gives me an opportunity to be there very frequently. So I, um, for, during the time that the museum has been closed to the general public, I have um, been involved in, uh, as um, our CEO Joe Shami mentioned, um, in uh, uh, this grant that we received from Homeland Security. We, we uh, had all of our landscape lighting, external lighting done, and uh, the restoration to the doors. Um, a surveillance system, which is state-of-the-art, uh, our access system as well. And we have just uh, completed that. It's been a, a, a long haul, but um, the end result is very satisfactory. I um, am <clears throat> very proud to be connected to this museum as being part of the Order of Sons and Daughters of Italy in America. I've learned a great deal since I became a docent <laughs> Uh, not so long ago, I became a commissioner. I'm still actually um, serving as commissioner in addition to being a chairperson. Um, and the history of, of uh, Garibaldi and, uh, uh, and Antonio Meucci is fascinating. Uh, I wanted to, if I could, spend uh, perhaps two minutes just giving a little bit of a background on, on Antonio Meucci's um, uh, incredibly gifted um, uh, as, a, as an inventor, it just there, there is very little comparison there. You know, he existed uh, for 40, 81 years during a time when there was a global um, scientific renaissance, per se, from 1780 to around 1910. And in the midst of that, uh, he benefited from uh, studying the works of his predecessors, like uh, Giovanni excuse me, Giovanni uh, Galvani, uh, or no, I'm sorry, it's Luigi Galvani, I should say, and uh, uh, Alessandro Volta. Uh, they were doing a lot of work with the batteries and the electrical uh, uh, conduction of that. And uh, through that, uh, he was uh, experimenting on how electrical charges would transmit through wire. Uh, for some reason, he had this incredible idea that by doing that, uh, he could resolve uh, the pain of a migraine headache, for instance, when he was in Havana, Cuba. And he, um, uh, one day, uh, he had set this up, uh, he, you know, he was at a quite, quite a distance from the, his patient, per se, uh, and um, uh, he used too much voltage, and the gentleman who had the wire in his mouth and held the other wire in hand uh, screamed. And uh, he re <laughs> Tony Mewitch realized that the scream then you know came through the wire, and from there you know he kept on uh, and on and on experimenting, and uh, eventually he had the uh, uh, the beginnings of what he called the teletrofono, uh, tele telefono, teletrofono, telephone, 
Um, and he used it, uh, this preliminary uh, prototype, to communicate with his wife, um, Esther uh, Mochi Meuchi. Uh, they resided in this beautiful home that we see in the background. She suffered from severe uh, arthritis. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, she could not, she was bedridden for quite some time and he would communicate with her from his laboratory to the second floor. Uh, so that was uh, the beginnings of the tele telephone. Uh, but he's not just, he should not just be remembered as someone who uh, began, uh, you know, the path toward having uh, the refined version of a telephone. He, he was, a, as I said earlier, a, a tremendous genius. And, and he was involved, for instance, in cre he had patents, several patents. One patent had to do with um, manufacturing candles, uh, a process by which you would expedite and create these uh, beautiful candles that he uh, painted in the Italian flag. Um, and he also invented, and he has a patent, there was a patent of, of a wick that was smokeless. In those days, you, if you lit a candle in the wick, you, it would be uh, create a lot of residue. His invention pre the, uh, diminished that or at least eliminated at least uh, the, um, the, uh, the burning of the wick. Um, there are other inventions that uh, he perfected uh, from having studied his predecessors as well. Uh, the, there is um, uh, a patent that he obtained for refining a uh, hygrometer, which is um, he, he was able to establish a way of, of uh, determining the levels of humidity in the atmosphere. Uh, so the first invention was created and then he refined it so that it was more accurate. So that, that was should be credited to him as well. Um, uh, creating, again, another patent where he created um, a way of having a refined paper uh, from, from uh, vegetable fibers and, and wood pulp. Uh, so that, uh, there's a patent there that exists uh, in his name as well. So to make, uh, I mean, I could go on and on. Uh, I just want, I, I'm so, I, I want to show a photo of him. It's a very large, we keep this in the Miyuchi room. Is it, is it possible to, uh, which way? Fold the forward. This way? Okay. You want to bring it down there? I can't see it. I, I don't have to be seen. I can. Right, there you go. <laughs> Is that okay? You're going to turn it maybe to the right. To my right? To your right. Uh, the other way. Is it my, the light? Oh, to, yeah, if you, if you tilt it forward, I think it'll be oh, there okay. You, there you go. Yeah. I, I think what's really important, uh, you know, as we speak about Meiuchi, yeah. is the fact that uh, he. Uh, was finally recognized because he uh, did not live uh, with a lot of money and died in basic poverty. And finally, in 2002, uh, thanks to Congressman Vito Fasella, he was recognized by the United States Congress. So that is very important as, as the true inventor of the telephone. There have been many others because in that period of history in America, there were many people experimenting. But his problem was that he was penniless and he obviously could not speak English very well. And the judge at the time gave him a very hard time, uh, mimicked him uh, for his uh, accent. And as a result, he couldn't make a good case. But we've, we've weathered these storms for him. Right. And uh, that museum, the house that we see, uh, it, it flourishes. So that's it, the important. Isn't message. it a fact also that Alexander Graham Bell was on the board of directors of AT&T at the time this happened? Yes. So uh, Alexander Graham Bell, who eventually got credit for inventing a telephone, literally, I hate to use the word, but stole the patent and, yes. and ran with it. And today, to this day, even though Congress uh, said that the, the, uh, the true inventor was uh, the, the, uh, the Antonio Meucci, I still teach in school the Alexander Graham Bell. Was it was the inventor of the telephone, which is well. The, the the thing that it reinforces that fact is that Alexander Graham Bell was a toddler when when Antonio Meucci began his discovery <laughs> of the telephone, and so I mean, there's an entire story behind you know how he got uh, uh, ripped off in a sense from his. Uh, that's a great word, <laughs> and um, he. Uh, 
unfortunately passed away when he was in, involved in a lawsuit in the middle of the you know this lawsuit that uh, Joseph mentioned. Uh, he died, uh, and I, I think it it's it really. I mean, he lived to be eighty one, uh, but I think that uh, when he found out that he had been robbed to that extent, he. he it affected him tremendously, especially when he was treated as he was, uh, like he was, uh, because he didn't speak English well, that he, he, he was not um, a bright person, per se. In those days, it was not unusual for Italian no, people to be treated that way. Exactly, exactly. But uh, I'm proud that uh, we're able to bring out the truth. Tell me, Carl, what does a museum do for a children, education, uh, uh, visitors, and so on? There's a variety of programs that we have. Well, absolutely. Uh, in, uh, children and adults, we have a, uh, an education coordinator. She's a bright young lady, um, Mary Ann, uh, no, I'm sorry, Anne Marie Cicero. Uh, she, in fact, we were communicating yesterday. She came up, comes up with some very innovative ways of, of uh, meeting the needs of, of uh, remaining active in a time when, we, you know, the museum is not uh, open to the public. And so it's this latest. Um, suggestion and proposal that she's made is to create a, a virtual uh, scene of um, the museum and, and then include the various uh, vignettes that, that last uh, three or four minutes per se, calling it uh, uh, a few minutes with the Meucci's or a few, a few minutes at the Meucci's or something to that effect. So there are other programs uh, that uh, we have opera classes uh, run by a very uh, uh, knowledgeable professor, Professor uh, Louis Leonini. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Louis, Louis Barella is the, the opera person. And uh, Louis Leonini is the Italian language uh, teacher. We have Rose Rosario as well, who's an excellent uh, Italian uh, teacher. We put those programs on hold, obviously, for the obvious reasons. But uh, we're working toward uh, alternatives present. But under normal circumstances, before COVID, uh, Italian was being taught and uh, the variety of other, other opera uh, classes would be right. There's always a, a concern that we maintain things culturally relevant to, to the history of Italian American culture and heritage. Uh, so uh, everything we do, in fact, there is a, an exhibit that we are preparing uh, that will be soon uh, exhibited. Once we open, it will be exhibited to the public, but we're also going to have a virtual a rendition of it uh, on Saturday. I'm, I'm going to greet uh, the um, art, the contemporary artists that are involved, Annalise um, uh, Jensen, uh, uh, who is uh, uh, preparing a, a, a wonderful exhibit of. Uh, it's called uh, poetic action. Poetic action. It's related to Elizabeth Barrett Browning's 1999 line poem that she wrote in a period of three years while she was living in Florence. Uh, and it happened during the time that the Austrians had a very strong dominance uh, on the Italians and there was this unification movement, the Risorgimento. And she, through her, this very lengthy poem, um, included uh, Anita Garibaldi, Garibaldi and her uh, as a political uh, slant in favor of this oppressive uh, uh, way of life of Italians, uh, and she was encouraging or at least hoping that uh, the unification would take um, effect. So there, it is a very culturally relevant uh, exhibit. And uh, we'll get back to the uni re re reunification in a little while. I think that's very important uh, from now on. Uh, the, um, the uh, Joel, I'd like to hear how long you've been involved with the museum. I know you, you, uh, well, you've been involved with the museum for decades. Well, the story is that uh, for many years, the museum was not open. Uh, from 1919 all the way really up to 1985, one could only go to the main gate, uh, which is on Tompkins Avenue, and there was a bell there. One would ring the bell, and there was an elderly couple that actually lived in the house. And they lived on the second floor. They had a daughter, a young daughter, who I met a number of years ago, who had grown up in the house. And when the bell was rung, they would come down. They would ask the person to identify himself or herself. And then, obviously, there was no testing the way we have today, naturally, for temperature and other kinds of testing. But uh, and, and imagine that that museum lived through the Spanish influenza as well. So it's, it's quite a sight. So they would go in and they would take the tour. 
Finally, in 1959, after, as I mentioned earlier, that it became a 501c3, a collection was assembled. And they did a preliminary collection of artifacts of Garibaldi, Meucci, photographs mostly. But it was in 1985 that the then state president of the Grand Lodge of New York, Nicholas Villetta, had asked me, and I was the state's second vice president, that in addition to my duties, if I would go to the museum and open it. And I said, well, we don't have any money. And he said, well, you know, use your creativity. <laughs> and so I begged as a mendicant, uh, as St. Francis of Assisi, and we raised some seed money. And from the seed money, we then went on and we hired a curator. And from there on, it's just never stopped. Since 1985, 86 is when the museum has never closed its doors. Even now uh, with the COVID that has taken place, um, we've had the carpenters work, we had activities. Uh, Carl Chacho is the chairman of the museum has been there. I've been there once or twice during the period. And the administrator, Stephanie Lundegaard, has been there to oversee anything that's going on. So we've never left it alone and happily we've raised money. We now have a wonderful endowment, very, very modest, enough so that we could keep open for a year if every single cent dried up. And the pride and joy in raising money is our Garibaldi pathway. So that leads you right to the front door of the museum. Well, I, I would like to uh, give a shout out to the Capodanno Lodge in Staten Island, uh, Long Island, uh, New York. Carl Chacho is a member of that lodge. Without the uh, Capodanno Lodge, there would be no museum. I say I, that I, all the I, time, I, Carl. I'm full and agreement. I mean every word of it. I'm in full agreement, uh, having been president and uh, media past president, uh, now serving as a trustee of the lodge. Uh, we have wonderful people who are totally committed to the museum for many, many years. Uh, Fran Cicero is one. Um, we have Colette Grillo. Uh, th these are uh, people who are basically, you know, are constantly giving their all to make sure that the museum uh, solvency remains in good order. We have Joreen Calantono. As mentioned before, uh, we have Stephanie Lundegaard, our administrator, which is a wonderful person uh, and dedicated to the museum. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to uh, take up too much time because we need to mention about our November 14th gallery event, uh, virtual gallery event. Uh, Joe, do you want to do the honors of that? Well, it's going to be a great day. We, for the first time in our history, we're having a virtual luncheon. We've had a luncheon now for the last 35 years. This is this because year, of the pandemic. It will be virtual, probably a 45 to 50 minute session. It's very similar to what the actual luncheon is like. And we have three wonderful honorees. The first honoree is Robert Graham, outgoing director of the Museum Commission. And we also have Giada Valenti, international singing star, uh, who now is in Las Vegas. And we will also have New York State Comptroller, the Honorable Thomas DiNapoli. Um, we will have a virtual journal. We have raffles going out. And actually, we'll be modifying and showing people actually where they're sitting at tables. Uh, there'll be table sponsors. And the purpose, of course, is to raise money to keep our funds going so that we don't really dry up. Um, there's At the end of the program, of course, there'll be a website. And we want to stress membership. That's very, very important. Becoming a member of the Garibaldi Michi Museum, it's not a very costly matter. And it gives them a year's membership the ability to come visit the museum and support us. As Italian Americans, we have to be proud. We have to be proud of our Italianita. And we know that Garibaldi and Meucci came from distant lands, our motherland. And uh, having visited Caprera, which is where uh, a wonderful Garibaldi is buried, uh, I had felt such a sense of closeness to him. And then knowing what Meucci did and the fact that Meucci's remains are on the grounds of the museum. He and his beloved wife, aesthetic. So uh, we have such connections, and that's the legacy that I feel we are passing on. And you, as state president, uh, you are really the repository of this responsibility. Um, and so I'm very proud to have okay. served there as the first, uh, you know, as a chair. There were two chairs before me, and we've gone on. And uh, Carl has has erected a beautiful poster at the museum of all the chairs who've taken on this responsibility. No one is paid except one person on staff uh, and, and she doesn't work full-time hours. So we're, we're carrying on the tradition since 1919. There are not many organizations that can boast about that. So I think you, Carl, I, we can all walk away each day feeling very proud of that home that was constructed and built in 1843. 
I, I, I want to repeat that. No one is paid. Carl is not paid and, and Joe is not paid. I believe there's just one paid employee. But yes. I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, ask you to say a little bit about uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi and how, why he's so important to Italians. Well, having read um, widely to a certain extent, you know, uh, not too deeply, but I, I have a, a, a picture of the gentleman. Uh, not only was he courageous and valiant and, uh, uh, and, and fought many battles, uh, and Anita Garibaldi fought alongside him before she unfortunately passed um, at a very young age, um, he, he was a, a progressive thinker. He, he was anti-slavery. He was uh, uh, in favor of having equality among uh, men and women should be e treated equally. Uh, he was against any repression, any type of repression or, uh, toward any, any individual. Th now those things, th those, that mindset was rare in those days. You know, it, it just, I, I, that's what sticks in my mind of, in, in the respect that I hold for, uh, aside from, of course, being, you know, the, uh, Uniter of Italy, you know, by 1870, you know, the glorious uh, moment uh, took place, and uh, he definitely should be remembered uh, in eternity for what he accomplished. And he started in your region in the unification in Sicily. See, well, he came from Genoa to Marsala with his thousand Emile uh, red shirts, and uh, he um, accomplished a great deal there. Um, a good friend of mine is writing a book, in fact, on his, uh, his life and uh, battles. I'm hoping to, that it would be published soon. And there are some new tidbits about his. Um, uh, if I, I don't know, if we have a, a, a one one uh, twenty second anecdote. <laughs> and Professor Leonini, uh, who is also a teacher of Italian, he, he's a historian. He shared uh, many many uh, little stories, but uh, this particular one. As I said, we had a, we have a kiln in the back of the museum there where they used to make candles, and during the time that Garibaldi came as a, and was hosted by the, the uh, Mayuchis for over a year, year and a half or so, he helped them to make the candles. But he had a, an aversion or an allergic reaction to the fumes that uh, with the melting wax, and uh, he would have to step away and take a walk, and um, you know get himself together again and come back and continue to help them and never never told them that he was suffering as he was uh, because he was uh, very proud to have been uh, you know their their uh, guest for such a long time and having been received so well T Antonio and and and, um, and Giuseppe Garbaldi were intimate friends so he is a great general and a great scientist making a living selling uh, candles yes yes <laughs> and there is there is a, some mystical uh, uh, component to hold this that you know it comes to Elizabeth Barrett Browning was born in 1806 Garibaldi was born in 1807 Antonio Mucci was born in 1808 and now we are putting together this wonderful exhibit that it, it talks about the Garibaldi's re, you know the involvement in the Risorgimento. And, and, and I need a garbaldi. It's just a it kind of full circle, you know. And I'm glad that um, I am uh, a part of that. that it, I, isn't it a fact that that Abraham Lincoln asked Giuseppe Garibaldi to be a general in the Union Army? Yes, it was through I think his Secretary of State. I'm not sure exactly if it was direct communication, but uh, there was um, a refusal on his part. As I said before, he was anti-slavery. He wanted to know if the Civil War was specifically about uh, you know abolishing slavery. And uh, to some extent, uh, at least, you know, if, if not 100% accurate, uh, historically, whether he refused to partake in being uh, and lead, um, you know, uh, as a general in the Civil War, because his, he felt that perhaps it was for other reasons and that not necessarily for the abolishment of slavery, which, of course, was a, a, a big component of that, according to Lincoln's history, you know, with his motivations to do that. Um, if I may, I, there, there is, I want to put a plug in. <laughs> you put a plug in, then I would like you to show that beautiful tunic. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, since September 4th, we held an outdoor event, an open air event, which was successful. It was an opera night on uh, uh, October, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, September 20th. We had uh, a musical concert 
and it was so well received. We had over uh, 90 people showed up for this open air. And now on October 4th, Sunday from 4.30 to 7.30, we have the Fall Harvest Moon Festival. And I invite everyone who's watching, anyone who can reach us, bring your lawn chair and enjoy a wonderful picnic at the museum. It will probably be the last event of the season because of the weather conditions will dramatically change in the near future. But I hope to see everyone there. Please come, Mary and I will be there. We're committed to go there and we're looking forward to it. And I'm sure Joe will be there. It will be a wonderful afternoon. But we have a very, very, very special uh, uh, artifact that uh, Carl Chacha would like to show everyone. And uh, this is an amazing piece of history. Okay, I'll hold it from here. So this way my hands are not seen. Uh, but this the, here, the, the significance of the shirt not only is because it's one of the original shirts that his daughter preserved, but the story is that it had to be framed most recently because it was part of an international exhibit at Ellis Island. And um, they were honoring uh, various important people and Giuseppe Garibaldi was selected and the museum officials were approached, could we lend this particular shirt? So what you're seeing really has come off, Stat off Ellis Island. It's now gone back to Staten Island, but here it is in Belmore, New York. And this is an actual tunic wore 150 years ago, 160 years ago by Giuseppe Garibaldi. I, and there I, were the, only two the, shirts. The so uni one or two and the unifier of Italy. I cannot say that enough times because before that, Italy was not unified. It was still in Italy, but they were all di different regions. But he took it upon himself again with a thousand men wearing these shirts, which I understand that he found because they were cheap. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he didn't have the money and he was able to get these at a reasonable price. And these were the actual tunic that he wore during the campaign. So thank you very much, Carl. This is at the museum. If you want to see it in person, you go to the museum and you will see it in person among other things like, what other artifacts do we have at the museum? Oh, there's, there's a plethora of uh, artifacts and there are too many to um, uh, present today. Uh, these are just a, a couple. He, this photograph here sits in the Meucci room. We have uh, uh, prototypes of, of his uh, teletrofano uh, in his room. Uh, we have his death mask actually, that's uh, uh, highlighted. Um, uh, on the, the Garibaldi room is full, full of uh, artifacts. Uh, there's another red shirt that's encased as well as uh, uh, paintings. So there's one of uh, uh, him carrying Anita as she is um, uh, dying from her wounds. So I think she was, uh, she was expecting a child and uh, I'm not sure if it was the, the, uh, the cholera or malaria or a wound that she I still have to look further into that, but she passed away young, unfortunately. But and you so have his pistol, you have his, have uh, his, his, his long his, gun. In, 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 yes, we have pistol, we have his bust. There are two busts of, uh, of um, Garibaldi in the Garibaldi room. And of course, upstairs, there's Garibaldi bedroom. bedroom. His um, bedroom is preserved other than the medals that were taken away after his passing. You know, you, you have to realize what Italy was like and what the Italian Americans here were like. They venerated him uh, like as the early uh, Americans venerated George Washington. He was, you know, the hero of two worlds. He helped unite Italy. And when they came to America, they recall that. But his medals were at the museum. But during that period, once he died, up until when the Sons of Italy took over, that house was not cared for properly. So as a result, people came in. And if they could walk away with a piece of memorabilia, they would have done it. So regretfully, you don't have the, the medals, but we do have his pistol, we have his rifle, we have his bed that he slept in, and we have other artifacts in it. And the big thing in passing this on to younger generations is that when the school groups come, the kids are awed by it. You know, they sit in the main Garibaldi gallery room, they watch a video, it's instructional, they learn a piece of history, which as we all know, they will never learn in the history books of America. Just that, just the way they don't learn about Columbus, they are not learning about Giuseppe Garibaldi and Antonio Meucci. So the museum is, is a living element in the study of history and, and we're keeping it alive. So that's, that's I think, what the Sons of Italy should be thanked for. As we get towards the end, I, I would like to make an appeal to any of the people, uh, president of lodges that are listening in right now. You all have a wonderful day. 
uh, once this pandemic is over, plan a trip out to Staten Island, plan a trip with a bus. You can go there and visit the museum. I, I, Joe or Carl will recommend a great restaurant for you to have lunch and you can have a wonderful day. And I guarantee you, when you walk away, you will feel so proud to be an Italian American that you say, Tony Nacarado, you're a great guy for recommending it. So please do it. I, by my own lodge, did it a few years ago. We're going to be doing it again soon. And thank you very much, Carl. My I pleasure. appreciate it. Thank you very much. I appreciate everything you do. And again, he, he's there almost every day as a volunteer. And it's not something we should forget. Uh, thank you, sons of Italy. Thanks you and the sons and daughters. Thank you. Joe, thank you very much for everything you've done since 1985. Oh. It, it's been a, a, a wonderful, uh, I know you're involved in a million things. I don't know anybody busier than you. Yeah. We could spend a half hour you telling are. people. <laughs> But thank you very much for everything you've done for the Italian American community, and God bless you all. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you had a good time today learning about a great jewel of the Italian American sons and daughters of Italy in America. Thank you very much.